All right, guys, we are back again, and today we are discussing a whole new topic, and it's particularly going to be a discussion on the metabolism of proteins. Protein metabolism. You are now aware that when we discuss metabolism, what we normally do is go from the process of synthesis all the way into the process of breakdown. However, for a change this time, I probably want you to focus on how these proteins are going to be broken down so that when it comes to synthesis, it's going to be linked to the nucleotides because we want to bring it all the way down from there. So today, I just want to discuss proteins. You and I know what proteins are by now. These are actually, uh, uh, they are actually polymers produced from amino acids. You may be aware we have about 20 amino acids that are actually encoded for and these amino acids are the ones that are used to produce these proteins. So in the body, you would find that you would have a number of sources of proteins. So there would be a number of sources of proteins. Primarily, some of the sources of proteins are actually going to be from diet. So you would take in your proteins, and once you take in, they undergo a process of digestion, they are absorbed, and then there will be protein synthesis as it were okay then other sources you discover that you would just have proteins that would be generated from endogenous um, amino acids that would already be there so that is particularly about uh, briefly about the proteins you know that proteins would have a lot of functions some of the functions of proteins would include in transportation you would find that proteins such as albumin would be necessary for transportation of uh, hydrophobic molecules in the blood. You would also find that there will be components of lipoproteins to assist transportation of things like uh, lipids, which would include cholesterol, triacylglycerols, and so on. And this is going to be from the sites where they are produced into the peripheral tissue and from the peripheral tissue back into the liver where they are broken down. So that is particularly about proteins. We also know that proteins can work as, uh, let's say, molecules which would catalyze certain chemical reactions. They would actually make most of the enzymes. While you and I know that not all enzymes are proteins, we also know that most of the enzymes are actually proteins. All right? So we said that these proteins are actually going to be produced from amino acids. And from our previous discussion in general about chemistry, we discussed the 20 amino acids and their nature. We also said that some amino acids are essential while others are non-essential. So amino acids, which are the monomers of proteins in this case, would particularly be the ones that would be used to make the proteins. Sources of amino acids, Amino acids would actually be produced, some of them would be produced in the body, primarily from the breakdown of endogenous proteins. Others would actually come from your diet. So, particularly, you would be thinking about the essential amino acids which you would really need from your diet. All right? So, from the breakdown of proteins and from the diet, you discover that amino acids would actually be produced. Other amino acids can also be produced metab uh, metabolically, where certain chemical reactions would lead to production of amino acids from intermediates of certain uh, metabolic pathways. For example, from the metabolism of um, carbohydrates, breakdown of glucose in the TCA cycle, you can produce a number of amino acids. That is about the amino acids and particularly where you will actually source these amino acids. So what are some of the uses of the amino acids? Amino acids would be used to produce the proteins to start with. They will also be used to produce some of the molecules such as creatine, which are the nitrogenous compounds. They will produce creatine, they will produce the porphyrins as well, which would actually be used to make molecules such as um, uh, cytochrome enzymes, for instance, and they would also be used to 
make uh, hemoglobin. So these are some of the uses of amino acids in the body. And we have a number of amino acids that we can consider in this case. But in this instance, I just want to further explain to you how these amino acids would find their way into the body. You and I already heard what we had said when we said that the amino acids are usually going to be taken in as proteins. So you would consume the proteins and these proteins would be made of a long chain of amino acids which could run from the end to the carboxyl terminal. And once these, amino, uh, these proteins are taken in, they will actually be taken in through the diet, so most of these meats that we eat would contain a lot of proteins. And once they have been taken into the body, these proteins are going to undergo the process of digestion. The digestion of proteins would primarily begin in your stomach. Interestingly, proteins would be some of the few uh, molecules that would be digested in the proteins. So they will actually enter into the stomach and because of the low pH in the stomach, which is due to hydrochloric acid, the hydrochloric acid that is produced from the, the parietal cells in the stomach would actually reduce the pH to somewhere around one to three. And then this pH is a conducive pH for the activation of the enzyme that breaks down proteins in the stomach. Particularly the enzyme that is working on breaking down the, 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 the proteins in the stomach is the enzyme pepsin. You'll be pleased to know that most of these enzymes are actually going to be secreted as zymogens, which are pro-enzymes. They will be secreted in an inactive form, and once they reach a particular environment, they tend to be activated. For example, the enzyme pepsin would lose something like a hexapep hexapeptide from the end terminal in order for it to become the activated pepsin and it is going to break down these proteins into, say, a shorter oligopeptides. And once it has broken down this oligopeptide, it's going to move from the stomach and into the duodenum. From your physiology, you can remember that the entry of uh, the food that comes from the stomach, which is acidic, due to the hydrochloric acid is going to stimulate the secretion of certain enzyme, hormones rather, which would include the hormone secretin and cholecystokinin. And once these hormones have been secreted, secretin in itself would have an effect on the pancreatic arsenal cells. You and I know that the pancreas has been made, is made of two parts. What is referred to as the exocrine pancreas, which actually contains uh, the ducts and it's going to, to carry the secretions from the pancreatic acid cells, which I probably would want to show you a bit. So we said that we have this pancreas, which has the pancreatic ducts there, and we have what we call the pancreatic acid cells there. These pancreatic acid cells would secrete their content into the pancreatic duct, and this is why they are referred to as exocrine. So these are this is the exocrine pancreas, which is made up of the pancreatic acid cells, which has its content secreted into the duct, and we move all the way into the second part of the duodenum and facilitate digestion. On the other hand, from our previous discussions, we made it clear that on the surface of the pancreas here is what we call the islet of Langerhans. And this contains the endocrine pancreas where you had a number of cells including the alpha, beta, gamma, and the delta, all of which were secreting hormones. Alpha cells secreting glucagon, the beta cells secreting insulin, which were necessary for the metabolism of glucose. So, in this case, our area of reference is particularly going to be the pancreatic acid cells. The presence of the food, which is going to come from the stomach, 
If low pH leads to secretion of the hormone secretin, and the secretin is going to lead to secretion of the contents in the pancreatic asthma cells, and this content contains bicarbonates as well as enzymes. But these enzymes would not be restricted to the enzymes necessary for the digestion of proteins. We know there will be enzymes necessary for digestion of carbohydrates and lipids, but in this case, our area of focus will be the enzymes that will be necessary for the digestion of proteins. So these endopeptidases mostly that will be secreted are actually going to be the following. You have trypsinogen, again, it's a zymogen, an inactive enzyme. There is chymotrypsinogen, there is elastase, which will be secreted as proelastase. And there will be two other enzymes called the carboxypeptidases, also secreted as pro-carboxypeptidases. Pro-carboxypeptidases. Peptidases. So these are going to be A and B. These are the enzymes that would actually be contained in the pancreatic juice, particularly for the metabolic, for the digestion rather of of proteins, also secreted in inactive form. So once these enzymes have been secreted, they are going to mix with the food that is coming from the stomach, and they are actually going to break down the proteins that are in there. So. The entry of these uh, zymogens into the stomach would lead ultimately to the activation of these enzymes, particularly because they are going to come together with the bicarbonates. You and I know that the food that is coming from the stomach has a low pH as the one that is in the stomach, and then when it reaches here, the bicarbonate which is contained in the pancreatic juice is going to raise the pH somewhere about 6.5 to 8, which is an appropriate pH for the functioning of this enzyme. And then on the surface of the brush borders here, there would be um, other endopeptidases which would activate pepsinogen to produce, or trypsinogen rather, to produce trypsin. And once trypsin has been activated, it will auto activate other trypsinogen and activate the other enzymes so that they become the active form of enzymes. I think when we discuss enzyme regulation, we may mention that enzymes can be regulated by being secreted as inactive enzymes. So, this is a classical example of this at play. So, trypsinogen is going to be converted into trypsin. Chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin, proelastase into elastase, and procarboxypeptidases are going to be converted into uh, will be converted into carboxypeptidase A and carboxypeptidase B, respectively. These are the enzymes that will play a role in the digestion of proteins. Now. These enzymes in themselves, their function would actually be somewhat specific. For instance, the enzyme that you see here would actually break the bonds that are supplied by only certain amino acids. For, as, for example, the enzyme trypsin, can I just remove this part so that it's trypsin, which is the activated enzyme, Chymotrypsin, elastase, and carboxypeptidases would actually have different <coughs> amino acids that will work on. So they work on, they work more as endonuclease, um, endopeptidases, right? 
Some of them will be exopeptidases, but most of them will be endopeptidases, which means a whole protein and then they're actually going to be cutting in between. So, trypsin is actually going to break peptide bonds that are actually going to contain amino acids such as arginine and lysine. These are the amino acids that would actually be worked on by trypsin. Chymotrypsin also has its specific amino acids. It will work on something like tryptophan, tyrosine. It will work on amino acids which contain phenylalanine, and it will work on those that contain leucine as well. These are some of the amino acids that it's actually going to, to work on. Also, I think it works on those that contain alanine. No, no, no. To work on those that contain methionine as well. Methionine. So the amino acids that contain uh, the boxy groups supplied by these amino acids can be broken by chymotrypsin. So you would have this oligosaccharide which came from your stomach being broken down even further by these enzymes and it's going to be broken down specifically. Elastins in itself would work on amino acids uh, on, the, on the carboxyl groups that are actually supplied by amino acids such as serine, alanine, and so these are the amino acids that is going to work on. And if you look at pro carboxypeptidases, these might usually target the carboxypeptidase A would usually target the, the, the non-polar amino acids such as valine, <laughs> isoleucine, uh, leucine. Uh, as the amino acids that is going to work on, and it also works on alanine as well. So it's valine, isoleucine, leucine, and alanine. These are the amino acids that carboxypeptidase A is going to work on. While carboxypeptidase B is going to work on amino acids similar to this, is arginine and Lysine. So once these reactions have occurred in your duodenum, which is the small intestine, you discover that you are going to end up particularly with a lot of amino acids existing as free amino acids and then they are going to be absorbed using what is referred to as a proton, a proton dependent sim porter. So particularly that is a form of facilitated diffusion that requires a proton to allow them to go in. So they are going to be absorbed, find themselves into the portovenous blood and there in the portovenous blood they are going to undergo different kinds of metabolism, some of which would include a use for protein synthesis, the other one would be used maybe for example for production of um, glucose, for instance, in gluconeogenesis, or maybe production of ketone bodies, production of, uh, of porphyrins, and so on and so forth. But some of the amino acids, such as arginine, 